Hello once again, it's Tubal Kane, and in this video I'm going to talk about how to buy and how to evaluate an Atlas Craftsman lathe. And I have three different lathes that I'm going to talk about, and if this video series is successful I'll do the same with South Bend and Logan lathes. Remember that these three brands of lathes are probably going to be the most popular ones that would be found uh, used and would be available and desired by home machinists. Now I have three Atlas lathes that I'm going to talk about. Initially this little six inch lathe right here in the foreground and then uh, I'm going to also talk about the larger one in the background there. But for this little one here in the front you might want to look at, uh, at this video where I have recently purchased this and I talk about uh, bringing it home and I show it while it's still at the auction house. The model number on some of these Craftsman lathes is uh, riveted right to the back here so that's not in the camera range but I did uh, write that number down so here is the model number of this lathe. I could not find a serial number and uh, I do not think that most of these Craftsman lathes had serial numbers on them like South Bend and Logan. This little Craftsman model maker lathe is a model number 101 and it's a 6 by 18. That means that you can turn uh, up to a 6 inch piece of work in there, a disc or a wheel or whatever, and that there's about 18 inches between centers and the bed is uh, 30 inches long and of course these atlas lathes were always uh, flat uh, ways rather than V ways. And this is just the way I bought it at the auction house recently. I haven't cleaned it up much other than to make sure it will uh, run and there were virtually no attachments. Uh, actually nothing came with it. It's just the way you see it here. Let me show you what it looks like in the catalog, but they produce these lathes in uh, several different models. Notice that this one has uh, what I would call plain bearings or oil light bearings as shown in the catalog. See how uh, there's a, a screw here to disassemble it. Later models were made with uh, Timken bearings in there, or ball bearings, I'm not sure which, but these earlier ones, and this would be anywhere from the 40s up to about the mid 50s before they switched to the other type of bearing. Let me show you what that looks like in an old Sears catalog page. I have several old uh, Craftsman tool catalogs, but these pages were printed off of Keith Rucker's website called uh, Vintage Machinery. Now if you've never looked at this website be sure and go there because there's just so much information about old lathes including pictures and uh, reprints of uh, catalogs and, uh, and advertising pages and things like that uh, and there's hundreds and hundreds of items that you can look at and some of them you can download and print out. But this page was taken from uh, Vintage Machinery and this is uh, from the 1941 catalog and there's the same lay that I'm showing you there and it was $58. And it came only with uh, gears and a dog and, and a belt, no motor and uh, that's uh, about all. I didn't even get the gears with it. Th those were lost in the shuffle but down at the bottom here are shown some of the accessories that were available for that little lathe and notice that they call it a model maker's lathe. This would be suitable for somebody that lived in an apartment or uh, had minimum room and was going to do very small work. It is indeed a very small lathe. Here's another picture of it and notice the bearings just like the one that I have here behind me. Here it is in 1960 they just call it a six inch metal turning lathe and by that point it had regular ball bearings or or uh, taper bearings I'm not sure which and and the price had come up to hundred and seventy five dollars at that time and remember these were made by Atlas Sears sold other lathes that were not made by Atlas sometimes under the name Dunlap and you may also see this lathe under the uh, badge of Dunlap rather than Craftsman. 
I may be showing you a little bit too in much information, but here it is in a reprint of the 1948 Sears catalog. And there again, it's called a model maker's lathe. It was $99, and that's what came with it. Again, the older style plain bearings. And some accessories there at the bottom. Here's a page from the 1948 Sears catalog, and this is the one that also might be sold under the Dunlap name. They call it the Model 80. It was $43, and notice that it does not have a carriage hand wheel. The carriage was moved by turning the lead screw with a hand wheel on the end. And also uh, in this 1941 catalog, they were using the, the Dunlap name and notice the hand wheels here but on these these two models here have V ways not uh, flat ways and I've never seen one of these uh, these lathes but let me cut real quick now to uh, some uh, footage I took at a friend's shop where he had one of these for sale for about hundred and fifty dollars and it came with uh, just a pile of gears and that's all there was and this particular lathe now has uh, instead of back gears, a system of uh, planetary gears to reduce the speed, and I think I show that in the video, so stand by for that right now. I'm on a field trip now to take a look at other craftsmen's lathes, and here's a little uh, six inch lathe. It's also a craftsman. But this is a different model than the one I have. Notice that there's no carriage hand wheel, and in order to move the carriage, you have to turn the lead screw. This one is for sale. There's the gears. And there's an extra set of change gears. right here and that's the model number and he's even got the manual for it very tiny chuck and here it is from the back side it's a six inch swing And so that's what the model 109 looks like, but the jack shaft is apparently not here. And this is the little planetary gear system that is used to give it a slow speed as opposed to a back geared system on the other model. I went to the vintage machinery uh, uh, site and printed out some pages here for the six inch lathe. That's, again, that's the model 101, just like I have here, and I'm going to get back to that in a minute. And, and there is a parts list there, so go to his site for uh, instructions on these older lathes, and there's the parts breakdown. But there's only one sheet, it's not great detail on that. This may be a bit of a repetition here, but this is the 1966 catalog that I had in my archives here, and they do show the uh, six inch lathe, and with bearings though, and that's what came with it, and that was $229 by 1966. Let me show you that also in the Genuine Atlas catalog. This is the Atlas machine tool catalog from 1950 when they were already 50 years old and here among other things is the six inch atlas they don't call it craftsman here but that's atlas no price is shown here there's a separate price sheet and quite a bit of information about the lathe but this one has the bearings let's see what it says here 16 speed headstock equipped with Timken bearings tapered bearings and there are two full pages of accessories for that. Much more, many more than what the Sears catalog shows. And even uh, some more on this page and they even had the milling attachment for that little lathe. 
All right, that's quite enough of the paperwork involved here. So let's go back uh, to the actual lathe and talk about it, some of its features, and what to watch for if you want to buy one. I have many other videos on Atlas Craftsman lathes you might want to look at, and uh, there's the badge right there. And remember that, uh, and a chart inside there, quite dirty that uh, all of the gears and many of the other parts on an atlas lathe are made of Zamac, which is an alloy of zinc, aluminum, and copper, and these were molded rather than machined. Uh, they seem to be somewhat delicate, but I really haven't had any problems with, with those gears stripping. There is no quick change gearbox on this, and this would have come with extra change gears as shown in the catalog pages, but these were lost in the shuffle when I bought this lathe. Of all the many lathes that I have bought over the years, I never have seen one that had a grounded third wire and someone deliberately clipped off that and this, is, this wire is way too light so it does need to be wired, uh, rewired properly but that's typical of the way that you're going to find things uh, at a sale. You could get a shock on this lathe uh, if you were on a concrete wet floor, if it isn't uh, grounded properly. So you want to rewire them. Often they're used motors, appliance motors, and the person that is wiring them is, uh, is not very knowledgeable. Another thing I don't like about this, it's very easy. This is a three-way switch, forward, off, and reverse. Typically, if you got it running and forward and you hit it, uh, you try to get it into the middle position, you go all the way to the reverse and you can spin the chuck off. So I don't like that setup, but it is nice that somebody set this up with a reversing switch and usually you're going to find them without the reversing switch, although that's not a, a drum type of, of switch and it's, uh, it's just not up to code. Also note the knob is missing off of, uh, of this inoperable lever here. So. You're going to see a lot of things like that that are wrong uh, or need to be fixed on a, on a used lathe. But you have to deal with it and weigh that. It, do you have to hire an electrician to do this or can you do it yourself? Because it would cost you a hundred dollars or more to have that rewired if you had to take it to a shop or bring a man in. So, but most people in their own home shop can, are jacks of all trade and although this guy wasn't. When you buy a used lathe, you're often going to find things you don't like about it uh, that are poorly done. For instance, here's uh, this has been set up on an old avocado green countertop, pretty shabby looking, and the motor is just uh, a gravity uh, tension. But look at how this was done with just a bent over bolt, and and uh, although we have a belt release here, it is not uh, set up to where it works. And here's the switch back here where you have to reach over the work is rather awkward. I was going to take this all off at the auction site but there were just so many screws and and wires and everything that I, I took the whole thing home although it was quite difficult to load. This is a very crudely built table and on top like I said a piece of countertop but it's not even long enough so they didn't have this bolted down on this end. You're going to see things like that are, that are kind of discouraging, but uh, that, that can be remounted. I do not intend to keep this lathe. I only bought this so I could show it, really, in this video. This is a set of change gears off of a larger Atlas lathe, a 10 or a 12 inch, and notice that they are not the same pitch or the same size and, and will not interchange. So do not buy a set of these if you think uh, that they're going to fit because they won't. Notice too that this uh, machine needs a new belt pretty badly. They're not easy to change because you got to take the spindle apart. That's probably the original belt. And also looking on this end, when you have a smaller lathe, remember that the spindle hole size is relatively small. And in this case, the largest stock that you can put through the spindle is a half inch. That's a limiting factor even on larger lathes sometimes. That, uh, buy a lathe uh, with the largest possible spindle hole if you have a need for it. 
When you look at one of these lathes at an auction or in somebody's basement, make sure you have a flashlight with you, but examine the gears. If you've got teeth missing off of the back gears, do not buy it. Because again, these are Zamek, and you're never going to find replacements. And, uh, but these all work. And there's the bull pin, and even a little indexing uh, pin here with 60 holes, if you can see them. Most of the Atlas lathes are made with these little indexing holes there. Do not use this to lock the spindle to remove the chuck. Nor should you use the back gear because you surely will strip a tooth. This uh, chuck was extremely difficult to get off and in order to do that I put a piece of uh, square stock in here with a, a hex end on it and used an impact driver just by holding the belts here and it did come off although I tell you it surely was pretty well stuck. but. Let me take that off again now, and this is a, a spindle on these small lathes that's one inch in diameter with eight threads per inch. That's a number two Morse taper. There is no name on the chuck. I thought maybe it would say uh, Craftsman on there, but, the, but there's no name on there. The, and if, remember, if you can only have one chuck, uh, a three or a four, you're better off with the four jaw, and that's what I do have. And this just has Gitz oilers here. And in the directions it says to oil before each use. And we got the feed reversing lever here and a nice little cover. It's a rather cute lathe and a very fine lead screw. I didn't um, check the uh, pitch yet. Examine the threads on your spindle very carefully that they are not chewed up or damaged in any, in any way, do not buy the lathe if that is, is damaged because you would need a whole new spindle and this is kind of the heart of the lathe. Also you can check the bearings on the lathe and uh, I think these bearings are replaceable uh, pretty easily but if on other lathes you, you may even uh, wiggle it as best you can or put a rod in there that, that you can uh, see how how much slop there is in the bearings. There is an adjustment on most lathes back here to take up end play. So you don't need to worry about that. But uh, when you're at an auction or a sale like that, you're not going to be able to put a, a dial indicator on the on the lathe to, to make a check. You can't really do that till you get it home and it's, and it's too late. If you buy a lathe that uh, is a disappointment to you, consider at some point uh, selling it and trading up and improving it uh, with, with a better lathe, the same as you might do with a used car. You know, you get one home and you say, oh, this isn't uh, what I had in mind, but it's like buying a used car. You cannot uh, test drive everything and uh, you're excited. You're always excited when you're looking at something and your mind may not be right and you overlook things and if you're a novice at this you you don't know what to look for and that's what this video is all about to, to help you with that but uh, again if it's a used lathe or a used car it is not going to be perfect however you may uh, enter someone's house when you're looking at a lathe where the guy was just super anal and perfect about everything you you will find these lathes sometimes almost unused or if they have been used much just uh, very well maintained by a meticulous old uh, jeweler maker or something like that now be sure and protect your bed at all times with a board or a very heavy rag when you change chucks or or tooling because that's the backbone and the foundation of the lathe, the bed. So it must be in good condition and well cared for and uh, uh, you keep everything oiled if it's an unheated garage to avoid rust and corrosion and you've seen what mice have done on some of my lathes by urinating on them and it's very corrosive. So uh, protect these things and again you, you're going to have to settle for imperfections in something that is used. As I mentioned before, this is a number two Morse taper, so you can also use a drill chuck, and these come in different sizes too, as a headstock chuck to hold your work depending on what you're doing. So consider that. Number two. 
Here's something I've never seen in my life. Usually people don't put the name on a lathe. They might put the, the name on their, their wrenches or, the, or their other, other tools, but this isn't the man that I bought it from, so this probably had many owners, but uh, the man's name evidently was Fist. But upon cleaning up the ways, and they really were dirty, and that's the only thing that I cleaned up, I found of all things that he had also put his name engraved it right on the bed. That, that kind of shocked me. I don't like that at all, but at least it's located between uh, where the tailstock rides and the carriage. So it's, I can feel that, and it's rough, but it's not on a, a, a place where it's actually going to interfere with anything. But that, I, I found it kind of humorous, actually. Now always examine the bed of a lathe before you buy it. Not that you can do anything about it, but you want it to be in good condition. And these little lathes usually didn't have much wear on them. They just didn't get used that much because they weren't in a factory. But it's in a very good condition right here. Sometimes you're going to see dings where they drop the chuck or, or just abuse it. There's quite a, a rust there that I can feel. But again, the, the saddle does not ride on that. So this is really remarkably uh, good condition in here. Watch for things like this, but I immediately noticed this at the auction house that this crank was broken off because again it's pot metal, die cast, MAC. But I saw this too even though the uh, tool post was on there that this had been broken out and uh, repaired by a hammer and chisel mechanic and it needs to be repaired again, but it is what it is. And I had no surprise when I got it home because I did know about that ahead of time, and that probably reduced the price on it. I'm glad that it came with the tool post rocker and in the ring and all of that, but there were no tool holders. And this uses smaller tool holders than what they use on the 10 and 12 inch Atlas lathe, and they had a couple tools in there uh, clamped in there, and that's apparently what was being used. There is a uh, thread chasing dial here. I'm glad to see that. Let me show you a few other features now on the carriage. Make sure that everything is, uh, is uh, on the lathe and not missing because you're going to have a heck of a time finding parts for these older lathes. But uh, we have a nice little carriage hand wheel, a half nut lever. There is no crossfeed, no power crossfeed, but again, we got the threading dial and a carriage lock here. And the compound seems to turn uh, all right, but we need a knob on there. And cross slide is fine and smooth. And turning the machine on real quickly. Notice the lead screw is turning. And that the, uh, the hot half nut lever, the power feed works fine. A lot of vibration on these little Atlas legs. I can feel the whole thing vibrating. But it is what it is, and it would probably serve some people just fine. Especially if you have not used other legs. Those of you that are not hardened and jaded by a real high quality, high end lathes such as Hardinge will not find that this is a lacking in certain features. But if you have used expensive lathes, it's hard to step down to something like this little model maker's lathe. But for a first lathe or somebody that, that has a, a budget, this might be just the ticket if you're doing small work. Let's look at the tail stock. The tail stock was missing the wrench. Often they're missing, so I, I cut off a Craftsman wrench. It's 11 16 and that serves just fine. The uh, ball bearing center did come with it. Looks a little bit rough. That's a number one taper that needs to be cleaned up. But be sure and examine the inside of the uh, tail stocks, although you can't even put your finger in there. Take a little flashlight along when, when you're looking at lathes. But that's a number one which is the smallest uh, of more tapers. You will need a sleeve or a larger center, a number two center, uh, if you're going to work between centers on this end. But the tail sock looks in good condition, operates fine. There isn't a whole lot of stroke here. I think on the quill, two inches it looks like, or a little bit less. And we have a, a working uh, quill lock back here that is just fine. 
And this is a two-piece tailstock, so you can do offset work and you can bring it back into alignment as shown in many, many of my other lathe, uh, lathe uh, videos. I have shown this Atlas book in many of my videos, and uh, some of them may be labeled Craftsman here if it was sold through a Sears store. But this is a wonderful book, every bit as good as the South Bend book, but this will also benefit you in learning how to use a lathe. And uh, if you look in this lathe, uh, much uh, this book, much of the information is about uh, the 12 inch lathe but will also apply to the 6 inch lathe but on this page here which is uh, near the back of the book uh, this is thread cutting on the 6 inch lathe and that's over uh, 20 pages just devoted to that and that follows in this book the uh, 20 pages on thread cutting with the 12 inch lathe so consider finding one of these books they may be out of print and you might have to find it on eBay also look for parts and accessories for these lathes on eBay or Craigslist those are your best sources by far probably your only sources and if you are serious and interested on uh, improving your skills and learning how to run a lathe remember these two books and then another resource and I hate to plug my own stuff, but is my video course on the Atlas Lathe, and that's 20 chapters that I offer that are many, many hours, and there's the titles of the chapters, and this is available on flash drive, and you can search uh, my videos from time to time when I make uh, video offerings on these that might be titled Back to School Special or something like that, but this is really a, a, a comprehensive course on how to run a lathe, pretty much based on the the South Bend lathe, of course, only applying to Atlas. And I also offer this for uh, South Bend lathe uh, as well. All right, back to the business here. When looking at these little six inch lathes, I think it is so much more advantageous to have a carriage hand wheel here than uh, the other model where you, the model 109, where you have to, to crank it here. I think that's a little inconvenient, although the bed on that lathe is shorter and this is all cast iron so it is rather nicely made and the compound will swing and I think I've talked probably enough about uh, this little uh, model 101 and uh, I think they made an awful lot of them under both the Craftsman, the Atlas and the Dunlap uh, badges so good luck when looking uh, at one of these if you're at an auction, you do not have a, a chance to turn these on. If it's in somebody's basement and there's a, a, an older person selling it or something, they, they can explain things to you and, and actually operate it, turn it on. And uh, you can determine what the value is, but I would say that the value on one of these is anywhere between two and $500, depending on what uh, comes with it. I'm also well aware that in certain parts of this United States, there aren't many machines available because they weren't industrial areas or they were rural areas or whatever, so that uh, some of you do not have the opportunity to buy these at auctions. I have seen, I've bought several lathes at garage sales. There they sit, you know, with a for sale sign on them, fairly cheap. But uh, that's also like looking for a needle in the haystack. eBay is another possibility. Auctions is the best, but also watch on Craigslist. That's a wonderful source of, uh, of tools and other things for that matter. So that concludes this uh, first part of the video. So now I'm going to step it up a notch and uh, talk about the 12-inch lathe back there. And I have two of those, one out here in the garage and one in the basement. So uh, I'll see you then.